it's great, uh, distinct pleasure I could introduce our keynote. Our keynote speaker, Linda Adams, has served as the Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency since 2006, and is the first woman to ever hold that post. She served, yeah, let's hear it. I like that. She served for 38 years in state government, working for 20 of those in the state legislature on environmental issues. She was also the Chief Deputy Legislative Secretary under Governor Gray Davis. In her career, she has worked on solutions to many of California's most pressing environmental problems, most recently as the lead negotiator on a little bill called AB 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. And she also launched the Green Chemistry Initiative to review the state's chemical policies, which I'm sure Bob is very happy about, if you're still out there. So let's give a big, warm ESPM welcome to our keynote speaker, Secretary Linda Adams. Thank you very much, Brad, and it's, it's great to be here. And what a great crowd already. I'm getting, getting an applause. And you know, I just want to mention this cartoon because I take it with me almost everywhere I go. And this is a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. I had to get special permission to uh, use this cartoon, but he drew this cartoon about the time of the, um, the, the little scandal when the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Climate Gate scandal, they called it, and whether it was a typo about how fast the glaciers were melting, um, but this was his response that we really are doing what we're doing on fighting climate change for many, many, many reasons. So I think it, you know, it illustrates um, many, many points, many, many reasons. Uh, Secretary of State, former Secretary of State George Shultz, you know, his number one reason is energy independence, but everyone sees, you know, something of interest to them, why they, why they are working on this issue. But I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon uh, at UC Berkeley and the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management's Graduate Research Symposium. And in California, of course, we have a long history of environmental leadership. I think it's in our DNA. I actually, I often get asked, you know, why are we always the leaders? Um, probably goes back to pioneer days, but it just comes naturally to California. And of course, before there was a federal Clean Water Act or a federal Clean Air Act, California was already blazing new trails of environmental stewardship because we had our own clean water and clean air acts and now we have special authority under the federal laws and of course we're not slowing down we've been hard at work developing and advancing climate policies at the state regional national and international levels and i've had the privilege uh, to be right in the middle of this um, as brad mentioned i um, when i was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2006, I had actually retired from state service and had a wonderful uh, year off. And uh, <laughs> as soon as he appointed me, you know, I, my whole career had been in the state capitol negotiating legislation. And I was just vaguely aware of this AB 32, which actually was just very close to his desk. And being a, a good uh, former legislative staffer, uh, the first thing I did was read the bill. And uh, much to my horror, what the governor wanted, his approach, a market-based approach to uh, reducing emissions was uh, not only not in the bill, but actually prohibited. So we, um, we had uh, a, quite a fight to uh, get uh, a, a very comprehensive approach um, to reducing emissions, which includes uh, uh, complementary measures and uh, cap and trade, which I'll talk about later. But um, with regards to Cal EPA, um, with the help of many talented people at each of my departments, boards, and offices, uh, we're developing uh, and implementing um, not only AB 32, but uh, as Brad mentioned, our um, green chemistry laws and um, uh, pesticide regulation, uh, clean air, clean water, and clean soil. <clears throat> and speaking of talented people, I'm very much honored to be here among such a talented group of individuals. 
And based on uh, presentations so far, it seems like uh, this program is churning out quite a crop of talented young scientists. And I hope some of you might even consider coming to work at Cal EPA, given that science is such an integral part of our agency's policy development. We do rely on our scientific experts when developing policies in order to make sound decisions based on the best science available. We depend on the accuracy, the timeliness, the relevance, and the needed answers that they can supply. In fact, just about every policy uh, decision, regulation that we make at Cal EPA is, is based on science. And we have a specific office uh, at Cal EPA um, that is almost primarily made up of scientists, and that is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, also known as OEHA, easier to say, and they help us identify uh, the most significant pollutants, their impacts on human health and the environment, and the levels at which they pose significant risk. OEHA scientists provided their expertise during the Gulf oil spill and routinely provide safe eating guidelines for fish. Cal EPA has hundreds of scientists in various areas of expertise. Not only do they make up the majority of OEHA, but they also serve at the Air Resources Board, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, the Department of Substances Control, and the State and Regional Water Boards. And I'll give you some of the examples of how uh, science and policy uh, relate at Cal EPA. Uh, we had a recent situation that you may have read about where uh, there was a, a, has been a spike in birth defects in a small um, Central Valley farm worker town of Kettleman City. So I brought together all my scientists, we have doctors on staff, uh, to seek their advice on what uh, chemicals might be causing these cleft palates, what should we be uh, testing for. So we looked at uh, potential links to water, soil, air, and pesticide pollution. Um, the Department of Pesticide Regulation provided models of pesticide activity during the formative months of these uh, pregnancies. The Air Resources Board monitored the air in the area. The State Water Board tested the tap water and the canal water for arsenic and other pollutants and the Department of Toxic Substances Control tested the soil for contamination. And of course, in uh, 2007, I launched a green chemistry initiative. Uh, we spend way too much time uh, developing uh, toxic chemicals and then spending uh, billions of dollars cleaning them up, so uh, we think there's a, a better way. Um, and we also, um, in 2007, there were 50 separate uh, pieces of legislation uh, going through the legislature that were attempting to ban or restrict the use of various chemicals. So everyone agreed, time out, let's come up with a scientific process. And I'm very proud to say that one of our partners um, in this effort is UC Berkeley, and you are, I think, one of the first in the nation to actually have a green chemistry program. Um, there, were, uh, there was legislation passed that required my Department of Toxics to um, adopt a regulation. This will be probably the most uh, comprehensive in the world to identify and prioritize chemicals of concern, uh, run them through a scientific process, decide the disposition, should they be banned outright, should their use be restricted in certain products like uh, children's clothing, um, hair care products, etc. Uh, it's a hugely difficult, uh, controversial process. Um, we, um, it, it's it's uh, pretty much equivalent to the effort under AB 32. That's how big it is. And we know that there are efforts in Europe, uh, the REACH program, but um, ours will be more comprehensive in that we will also look at it alternatives because we don't want what we call regrettable substitutions. We don't want to ban one chemical just to have 
uh, companies use one that's uh, just as, as toxic. And I'm also proud to say I formed a green ribbon science panel to help us figure out this very difficult process. And it's made up of uh, the, uh, I believe, mostly P, uh, PhDs and the, the brightest minds, not only in California, but in the country. And then I was also very pleased uh, last week when Governor Brown named my co-chair of the Green Ribbon Science Panel, uh, Debbie Raffel, who uh, currently works for the city of San Francisco. Uh, she was named um, as our new director of the Department of Toxics. So um, that's, again, that's a, that's a tough issue, and we will probably have uh, the most uh, comprehensive a program in the world. <clears throat> and um, I'll talk a little bit about AB 32. Um, our, of course, our uh, landmark global warming and clean energy uh, legislation. We actually um, regret that we gave it the name that it did because uh, uh, there's so much, uh, there, there's so many naysayers about uh, global warming that, you know, if we had called it clean energy, maybe we wouldn't be having some of these arguments. But um, the AB 32 um, scoping plan lays out a blueprint for how we will reach our goals to reduce emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. And the bill, um, after a, a bit of a fight in the legislature, allowed a market-based program, cap-and-trade program, along with complementary measures such as uh, low-emission vehicles, uh, which is a whole other story, our fight with the auto industry. I could talk about that for a long time. Um, renewable energy and increased energy efficiency. We have to do uh, virtually everything we can do. Even high-speed rail is in our scoping plan. So um, on December 16 of last year, the California Air Resources Board adopted a cap-and-trade rule, uh, which is uh, the market uh, is uh, supposed to launch uh, January 2012. Um, it's, we, we are set to move forward on that uh, market approach. And um, one thing we heard from California businesses, most of them did not want any cap, of course, but they said if we are going to do this, we would like a market approach. And one of the things they asked for was the ability to purchase offsets so that um, not all of their reductions have to come right there at their factory or their refinery, but um, a small portion from um, offsets outside of, of uh, their actual operation. The Air Board did allow a limited amount of offsets, and uh, when the Board adopted the cap-and-trade rule, it also adopted four offset protocols for our compliance market. And among them, uh, two of them were forestry protocols, one for urban forestry and one for U.S. forest uh, reforestation, forest management projects. And that's something I uh, personally push for quite a bit because we recognize that uh, deforestation around the world accounts for about 16% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the UN climate talks for years made no progress on forestry, you know, so thinking internationally, um, that's something that I pushed us to be involved in uh, the uh, forestry issue. So the forestry protocols recognize that as long as trees are growing, they remove CO2 from the air, transforming it into carbon and making use of it to build living matter, leaves, stems, trunks, and roots. And because forests observe atmospheric CO2 and store that carbon in woody biomass, they have the potential to provide greenhouse gas reductions when managed for climate benefits. We already have over 100 uh, re uh, forest management and reforestation projects submitted for approval as, as offsets, and those are projects all over the United States so that uh, PG&E and Chevron can uh, reduce a very small portion of their emissions through investment in forest management. Um, and in addition to U.S. forestry projects, we are also uh, venturing into uh, the international 
a carbon market in the area of forestry. Uh, this is, is uh, hugely controversial, um, so we have to make sure we do it right. Um, in support, so we're, I say, tiptoeing into the international market. And um, working with groups like uh, Conservation International, Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, uh, we identified um, some key states, uh, one in Brazil and one in Mexico, that are leading on uh, the RED program, uh, reducing emissions from uh, deforestation and forest degradation. And we have signed an agreement with those two states, uh, Chiapas, Mexico, and Acre, Brazil, uh, where they potentially will become pilots for our international carbon market. So we have a working group made up of many of those uh, NGOs and uh, government officials uh, to present to the Air Board uh, later this year or early next year a proposal so that these projects may come into the market as soon as 2015. Um, there's a huge amount of interest um, in, the, in the UN. Like I said, they've had a lot of trouble dealing with forestry. Uh, the issue of even a market-based approach is controversial, uh, but many are crying out for a private um, investment in this area, so uh, we're very excited about the potential. Um, so those will be, like I said, model uh, projects. So as we continue to implement AB 32 and look at specific uh, greenhouse gas reduction projects and how they fit into a statewide, national, and international greenhouse gas accounting framework, here's where the science is especially important. We need to ensure that all reductions achieved are real, permanent, quantifiable, verifiable, and enforceable. And we rely on the science to provide reduction and emission calculation methods to identify procedures for project monitoring, reporting parameters, and verification. Looping back to the relationship between science and policy, we need the scientific backing to reinforce the policy outcomes we seek and the research to determine if those sought out outcomes are possible. And we need those answers from the scientific community in a timely manner so we can make the best decisions that are based on sound science. So I think overall the key here is more communication and more connectivity between the two parties, scientists and policymakers, so that science can be more informed as to what we need what policymakers need and where we're going next so they can provide those answers and start research ahead of time, which would aid in our timeliness to create solutions. It's all one continuous cycle. So we at Cal EPA certainly value scientists for the role they play in helping us develop sound scientific policies that protect human health and preserve our environment. And we want to continue to work together to expand our knowledge of each role that we play and in what ways we can work together. So thank you again for inviting me here today. Uh, best wishes to you and your future endeavors. And I'd be happy to, um, to answer some questions if you have any. So thank you.